Hello, everyone. My name is Eric K. Thomas, Editor-in-Chief of the Quintessential Gentleman, and today we are talking to Mr. Matt Barnes. Uh, super excited to talk to him. He has a documentary out called Revolution, and um, I'm excited to talk about learn a little bit more about this documentary. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So I just want to start and find out why do you feel like this was the perfect time to release a documentary about, you know, your upbringing and all the things Matt Barnes? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, I've, I've been one of the rare <clears throat> players to retire, but still somewhat stay in, 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 in media and, and, and in this sports space. Yeah. And I think that I have a unique, you know, upbringing. And it, 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 my upbringing has defined kind of who I am <clears throat> as a man today. And I just kind of always want to shed light on what that upbringing was about and, and, and some of the ups and downs that I went through and, you know, kind of the, some of more of the good stuff that necessarily didn't fit my narrative as a player that doesn't, wasn't shown, but doesn't, doesn't, wasn't mean I wasn't doing it, but it didn't necessarily fit the narrative. So I think, uh, you know, <clears throat> revolution is giving us an opportunity to show more of me and in depth side of me and again some of the stuff that didn't fit the bad boy narrative that was painted on me as a player uh to kind of show who I am more as a man All right no it's awesome and definitely a, an amazing documentary um why do you think that more athletes you know kind of should kind of have this conversation around you know kind of what they're going through I think for us you know we only see the player we see the stats right. we see mm -hmm. if it's bad press but we never really get to see the story behind what it's like to actually be a basketball player or athlete why do you think it's important for those stories to be told well I think you know to the point you touched on I mean I think the world sees the finished product and they never see what you know what went into building you know this particular person or this athlete and uh, um, everyone has a different story, a different journey. And I think fans will draw some similarities to our upbringing then and, and some of the struggles we've been through to, you know, possibly motivate them or encourage them to, you know, chase their dreams, whatever that may be. So, again, I think, uh, you know, now more than ever, you know, athletes have the availability to kind of show who they are via social media, but that's never really a deep dive into what they were about. And again, I think this is uh, a really a deep dive. Uh, <clears throat> into who I am and, and, and how I became that person. And I think it's important to kind of see the full story because I mean, people are gonna judge regardless whether they know the full story or not. But it's, to me, it's, it's always cool to kind of have the full truth out there um, instead of people just kind of guessing what the truth is. Right, right. <clears throat> Oh, in the documentary, you say, um, through the loss of my mom, I gained my father. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, you know, uh... I grew up in the 80s and, um, you know, during that time, a lot of people, it was, you know, it was, it was, it, you know, it was a crack epidemic and all of my parents went on crack. They were functioning drug addicts and, and my dad was a drug dealer. So he did whatever he felt like he needed to do to provide for his family. Um, and then, you know, there wasn't much love there. And obviously getting older now, I got a chance to speak to him and then kind of under, uh, understand his upbringing and understand that he wasn't raised with love. So I just think, um, excuse me, thought I had to sneeze. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, what was the question again? I apologize. No, no, no problem. Say, um, the question was through the loss of my, through the loss of my mom, I gained my father and I want to learn a little bit more about that particular statement, why you felt that way. So again, you know, my dad was more of the tough love, so to speak, the, uh, you know, when I was being racially bullied at school, it wasn't the hug support. It was, you know, fuck that, excuse my language, if they call you a nigger, fight him. That was kind of his way of showing his love. So um, there was never really a huge connection with my father and I uh, growing up. You know, although he was there, I was, you know, fortunate, obviously, enough to have my father in the house. But outside of him being in the house, it wasn't really a connection. I felt like, you know, when my mom passed um, in 2007, it was kind of divine way of waking him up and you know making him be more present um as a father and um really this is the first time you know again when my mom passed I saw my my, my dad open up and explain his upbringing and apologize to us um about you know his learning on the fly so you know so to speak being a uh, being a father and really just kind of being vulnerable and for the first time in in my entire life so Again, I felt like, you know, unfortunately I had to lose my mom, but 
at the same time and woke my dad up. And now, you know, we're, it was just actually the 15 year anniversary of my mom's passing like a week and a half ago. But, you know, since my mom's passing, my dad and I have been on great terms, communicate often, you know, say, I love you often, which would never happened before. And, um, you know, he's a great grandfather to all his nieces and nephews. <clears throat> It's so interesting. I feel like we are kind of in a, a growth of the of the black man or even masculinity, right? Where we're now able to like have these conversations. I always say like the first time I know my father to say I love you, I was like 26, 27, you know, which is crazy. You know, exact same. We just had Will Smith uh, on our podcast, All the Smoke, and, and we spoke to a similar issue where, you know, his uh, you know, his father, as my father, was beating up his mom, just like my dad was beating you know, my mom and, 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 you know, what it felt like as a child to have to kind of just sit by and watch because we were powerless, um, so to speak, but again, be able to, to be able to come full, you know, uh, you know, 25, 30 years later and be able to have a conversation with him. You know, I had a conversation with my dad who was 66, 67, um, months ago talking about, you know, dad, I think you need some therapy. And I was kind of hesitant because I didn't know what his reaction was going to be. And his reaction was, you know, Matthew, thank you. I didn't know you cared. I love you and I'll do whatever it takes to get better. I'm just like, oh shit. You know what I mean? And again, that, and that's not an, although it's needed, it's not a normal our community. I mean, but hopefully, you know, with people, you know, like myself and Will and, and other athletes, you know, showing that, hey, these conversations, although they may be hard and kind of touchy, um, they can be very communities. No, that's actually a great point of having the conversation about getting therapy at an older age. Some people kind of like they're older, set in their ways, they're not going to change, but you know, you still don't know how much life you have to live. And why would you keep all of that built up if you can let it go and do better? No, I agree. I mean, I just feel, you know, when you come from, you know, un you know, underprivileged and, 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 you know, not very much money, we're just never really given the tools that we need to deal with our lives yeah you know the good and the bad you know you know same thing when you know we're coming in we come from nothing you come into money we're not necessarily given the tools to manage that and you see a lot of people blowing it but again on the flip side from a negative aspect we just you know our, our lives are trauma you know they talk about ptsd and that's a big thing but you know when you grow up in a household where there's drug abuse and, and, and physical violence, i mean that's ptsd you know what i mean you cross up you know your friend dies a lot of different things i feel like we we Experience and our upbringing that that may seem normal um that we do a good job of compartmentalizing and kind of pushing to the side when it's not normal and it shouldn't be compartmentalized should be talked about and it should you know it, it we, we should outlet to be able to have these kind of conversations with to you know again to ourselves and whether you know like me at 42 I'm, I'm in two different kinds of counseling you know, and I've been doing it for about a year, but, you know, my dad to be 66 or 67 and, and to really kind of step into the counseling space for the first time, um, you know, I think I, I thought it was a beautiful thing. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so I love the relationship you have with your children. It kind of seems like, you know, you didn't have that relationship. So you made sure you had it with your with your kids, which is a beautiful thing. Um, I wanted to know how was it or how did your upbringing impact how you raise your children now? Um. I just, you know, again, it to me, it's never too late to be a dad. And my dad and I have a great relationship now, but we just didn't when I was younger. And, you know, I just always said if I was, you know, had the opportunity to be a father, I was going to try to be the best father I possibly could, you know. So, and it wasn't always the money, the time, and the affection that I felt like, you know, was lacked and, you know, lacked in my childhood. So I got 14 year old boys now that think they're, cool as you know cool as the other fellow but yeah. still hugging one of my love them and you know obviously you know with my my four-year-old son just he's my little shadow you know what i mean but to not to really be afraid to just love on him and kiss on him and and tell him how much i love him and how much i appreciate him and still have to discipline him but let him know like hey i have to do this you know explain what what's going on so i just again no real book to it um you know you 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 learn as you go and again, I learned a lot from my childhood. And, you know, what's cool is, you know, my dad says he learned from me mm. on how, you know what I mean? Which is crazy because, you know, he's my dad. So again, those, those, those conversations can really lead to some, you know, in-depth soul searching. And, and, and really at the end of the day, we're all trying to constantly evolve and, and better ourselves. And, you know, as a man, father, businessman, I'm always trying to do that myself. <laughs>
No, of course. So, you know, we definitely are in, I would say, crazy times, but it's been like this for years, uh, being a Black man. Um, I want to know how or if you could provide any advice on fathers raising Black boys um, in America in 2022, about to be 2023. Uh, just raise real, well-rounded young men, you know, morals, values, principles, stuff to stand on. I think, you know, this generation is persuaded so easily because they see so much stuff on the internet. And most of the stuff on the internet isn't true. You know what I mean? So having that fine line of understanding that to me, the internet is entertainment and, and half the stuff you see probably never happen or won't happen. Um, again, my kids are athletes. You know, my older ones obviously want to play basketball as I did, but you know, whether that's God's plan or not, you know, I, I, I taught them business, you know, they have their own podcast now and we just, you know, they just did their first LLC and they're going to start making money. So just kind of getting, you know, teaching them tools again to be successful later in life. You know, like I didn't understand about an LLC or, and although I was in the NBA, you know, it was just all that stuff was taken care of for me. You know what I mean? So for me to be able to teach my teenage sons how to, you know, pretty much run their business, which is their podcast and, and accumulate, you know, cash for it and, and what to do with it and how to save it and teach them ways to possibly invest it uh, when the time is right. It's just, again, preparing them um, for what this world's about. You know, obviously, you know, we've had the conversations on police brutality, uh, you know, with the several killings that, you know, that, that have been brought to our attention in the last five years. And then, you know, when we talk about them, I'm like, you know, guys, these are just the ones that the media puts in spotlight on, but it's happening daily. Um, it's also happened daily in our own communities, you know, with, with, you know, us hurting each other, which is unfortunate. So, you know, you, you, so you want to teach them obviously right and wrong and to understand that, you know, my, I grew up on food stamps and, you know, living with cousins and living with friends. It's something my kids, you know, they grow behind gates and go to private school. So just to kind of have them have an appreciation for what, you know, the life you live is, is obviously not the greatest, but it, it's, it, it's, it, it's not the normal life either. You know, you are very blessed to be in the situation you are. So to have an understanding and a respect for, everyone else and and some of the struggles that the people go through as well yeah sure so inside the uh documentary you speak about um realizing a particular life you wanted to have outside of basketball what was what is that life that you are that you are living and want to live that's now not really kind of attached to being on the court um just doing other things i think that um you know, I was so blessed to play 15 years. You know, I got to throw a ball in a basket and, and make a lot of money from doing it. And, um, you know, with that comes a lot of sacrifices. You know, I went through a divorce towards the end of my career where, you know, I wasn't getting a chance to see my kids as much. So obviously that would weigh on my mind when I'm, you know, going into year 13, 14, 15, I'm missing birthday parties, I'm missing plays, I'm missing sporting events there was just so much I felt like I was missing that no matter how much money I was making I'll never get you know my kids will never be seven again they'll never be eight again there's things that I was missing so you know I just felt like uh you know with the culmination of, of winning a championship I mean 2017 season with the Golden State Warriors that it was time to kind of step away uh one to be a more present father uh you know just the simple things of although it drives me crazy now taking my kids to school you know something I didn't really get to do when I played and you know, I miss those times in the morning or picking them up from school or, you know, now I'm able to coach my kids as well. So from a fathering standpoint, that was really the, the most important that I just wanted to spend more time with my kids. And then, you know, what, 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 what's the next act in business? You know, what's, what's my next, you know, although I made good money, I knew that out there was gonna have, I was still going to have to find something that was going to bring in more money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I fell into this media space completely unexpected, um, had no intentions on hosting shows, being on TV. That Never my plan. You know, I wanted to kind of learn the behind. I want to be more creator, producer, learn how to direct. Um, you know, lucked up through a friend that was really persistent, you know, letting me know how well spoken I was in my interviews and I should try and, you know, being an analyst and doing all this kind of stuff. And, you know, took a leap of fate with that and, and it ended up, you know, being a blessing in disguise, you know. So the business side and kind of figuring out what my next act was, you know, I, I knew I invested well. So, I knew I'd have some money coming back from that, but kind of figure out what that next, again, what, what, you know, what, what's my next 20 to 30 years look like. Um, I just finished my first, you know, 
basically 20 years between college and the NBA, you know, now, and so what, what, what's my next song and, you know, what's my next move? And, you know, I've been able to find that and be successful in, in, in a few different spaces post-career. But again, the most important one to me is just time and, and, and the ability to be a father. Awesome. And, you know, one thing I did like about the doc is we got to see a lot more of the conversation around your activism, which we don't get to see from a media perspective or it's not highlighted as much. Um, I would like to know what inspired, you know, the uh, you to be more active in the activism space. Um, my senior year of high school, um, my sister was being um, racially bullied and harassed by a kid and one day he spit on her. Wow and she came and found me uh, he was a sophomore I was a senior and, and that happened to see that kid and you know I you know I beat him down you know, as every big brother should do um when I went to the office tried to explain what happened they didn't believe me um ended up suspending literally this is three weeks excuse me three months from head of UCLA oh. um while I'm being suspended the KKK comes and vandalizes my entire school burned down a, uh, a bathroom hung a mannequin on the big oak tree with my football jersey on, dyed niggers, swastikas everywhere, dyed barns everywhere. And, you know, for the first time in my life, although I'm very proud of being biracial, I realized that the world looked at me as a black man. So 1998, kind of pre-internet, no, obviously no social media. So there was never anything to kind of have my voice heard. Although the news interviewed me and some of the papers interviewed me, it was kind of like, no matter what I said, it was still kind of their version of what happened. So, you know, fast forward, and when was it? You know, 2014, 2015, begin the situation where I'm with the LA Clippers and our owner at the time, Donald Sterling, was recorded by his mistress, you know, saying whatever he said about blacks and kind of lost his, you know, lost his team. And I think that was kind of the first time where, although I was always outspoken here and there on certain situations, I think LeBron James took a big leap of faith for all of us. It kind of spoke on, you know, hey, there's no place like this, place for this in basketball. I think it kind of opened the doors for everyone to really, you know, once the king does it or, you know, once, you know, some of the best players do it, it kind of opens the door up for everyone else. So I then, you know, chose to continue to push the line and push the envelope for injustices, whether it be police brutality, racism, sexism. Uh, whatever it was, whatever I felt passionate about, whatever I felt like I had a connection to, to speak for those that necessarily don't have a voice or the platform to have their voices amplified. Um, because I do never forget, you know, although I've you know, done well in my life, I never forgot where I came from. And, you know, friends and family who've struggled and, you know, lost their lives. So I always felt like, you know, it was almost my obligation and my duty to utilize my platform in, 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 in this type of manner to continue to push uh, for change. Oh, awesome. So you speak a little bit about um, being interested in politics. Is that something you're really interested in and, you know, yeah. taking a step forward? Um, you know, I, 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 what sparked my interest was, you know, being from Sacramento and Kevin Johnson was, a, you know, a, I think 14 year, 15 year NBA vet. He went back when he was done and became mayor of Sacramento. And at first, it wasn't the policy side that necessarily uh, fascinated me. It was just the fact that he came back to our hometown and cleaned it up, and particularly his neighborhood. His neighborhood was rough. And, and you know, to, to, to see the, the life he brought to his neighborhood, it was just inspiring. And I'm just like, damn, well, if he can do it, why can't I? You know, so I set a goal in, like, my mid-30s um, that I'm going to try to run for mayor or even something higher, maybe a governor. Um, by the age of 50. So, you know, I'll be 43 in a few months. Um, still very interested, you know, continuing to learn policy and really have my hand in, you know, walking the Capitol and, and, and pushing bills and, and, and meeting, you know, senators who are responsible for, you know, policies being passed on the, on the state level. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely some interest there. Um, it's not a for sure, for sure, I'm going to do it. But again, it's something that, you know, I've put out there as a goal to possibly do if everything is aligned by that time, um, that I wouldn't mind possibly running for some sort of office. Awesome, awesome. Um, so after people watch Revolution, what do you want them to know about Matt Barnes? Um, I want them to know the real me, you know, the, 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 not the story you've heard or what you've seen, but, you know, the story. Um, and I want them to be inspired because I feel like, you know, I was, a, you know, I was looking to play 15 years. I was a blue collar 
guy. I wasn't a superstar. So I just feel like I'm much more relatable to people and, and inspirational to people. And I want to I wanna give them the inspiration to continue to push for their dreams, whatever that may be, uh, speak their truth, stand in their truth, you know, move with, you know, honor and, and, and morals and dignity and, you know, try to be a contributing, a positive contributing, um, you know, member of society. You know, because like I said, I think there was just such a huge misconception that I was a bad boy. I was a thug. I was a gang member. I was all this shit. And I was really just a competitive athlete. <clears throat> and since, you know, have really showed the world what I'm about. But really, I think all those misconceptions about me, I wanted to show people like why I may have acted or, or, or moved in a certain way is because the way I was brought and taught and the stuff I've been through. So I think at the end of the day, just to be inspired encouraged and, and and continue to want to elevate and better yourself awesome awesome and my last question for you is what can we look forward to from mr barnes oh man i'm you know continuing to be creative again you know stuff i'm doing with my kids with the barnes boys podcast season two will drop top of next year um working on several different projects um you know more behind the scenes so you know when it's time the time is right for those we'll announce those uh continuing to you know move in the media space be able to work for ESP, NBC, the Sacramento Kings, the LA Clippers, you know, showtime with all the smoke. So again, just uh man, enjoying life after basketball. You know, again, it's been a, such a tremendous blessing to have the, the 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 longevity I had in my career, but I still feel like I'm living a dream because you know, every day I get up and get paid to to still talk about the game and people want to hear what I have to say. So that's always a good thing. So just to kind of continue to look out for me on all fronts and you know, know that I'm there with you. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Barnes, I appreciate it. This was amazing, man. Thank you so much for this conversation. It was great. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. Good luck with everything. Of course. Thank you so much. Talk soon. All right, bro.